Hey, prospective officers. I'm Sea Lord Janda, and welcome to a hopefully short tutorial on how to play Rule the Waves 3. Now, if you've never played any game in this franchise before, and you've just bought it, you might be wondering what you've gotten yourself into. This is essentially a sandbox navy building game in which you do three things. You design and build all of the new ships that your fleet will have. You move them around on this strategic map and respond to the movements of any enemies that you should find yourself at war with. And you fight tactical battles against those enemies in time of war. Essentially, you control the call it the strategic and the tactical, but not really the operational side of your fleet. Now, when you first boot up the game, you'll be asked to choose a country. Well, okay. First of all, you'll be asked to choose a start date. I would say if it's your first game, start in 1890, but nothing terrible will happen if you start in 1900, 1920, or 1935. Uh, your ships will just be more complicated, basically. But it's whatever tech era you prefer, in a sense. However, any date you start goes all the way up to 1970. Uh, then you'll be asked to select a country. There's, I think, I think it's ten options now. Um, and again, you can pick whatever you want. The game is the s the game is fundamentally the same from the perspective of any country. Uh, what will change, of course, is your strategic starting position and your home areas and also then your budget and certain events that can occur related to your government type plus a couple of unique modifiers for every country but mostly they don't have a huge impact on gameplay if it is your first game the u.s is a pretty easy tutorial country since it doesn't have any uh huge local threats except possibly fighting britain in the late game and especially in this game you can get easy first wars against the likes of perhaps Spain. And as time goes on, you should have the budget, unless things have gone horribly wrong, to pretty much build what you want, make a few mistakes, and dominate the world. Um, if you do want something more complicated, Britain is also... It's relatively easy to dominate the world as Britain, but it is fairly complicated to run. Certain countries, such as, say... Italy have pretty good local situations. The really, basically the smaller, the there's no allowances for a country being small, so the smaller and more backwards countries like Spain, Austria, Hungary, Japan at the start, those are going to be the hardest to play. I wouldn't recommend them for a beginner. Um, on the settings screen, just before booting up, uh, you'll then be given one more settings screen. Most of the settings, such as, like, tech randomization and research speed, I would suggest leaving on your own, on their own, alone, for the first game. Um, but research speed, for instance, if you lower it or increase it, it will cause technology in the world to move faster or slower. The only one you might want to change is fleet sizes, which basically changes the entire world's wealth or budgets so that everyone will be able to build more or less ships depending what you adjust it's that's entirely a matter of preference it will get more complicated with more ships but there's also more room for mistakes so once you've picked all that you'll find yourself at this screen more or less you'll have a pre-generated uh, pre-built fleet that you'll start with and if you are new Maybe you'll have no idea what to do from there. I know the interface of the game isn't exactly the most modern, but I promise it's really not all that hard to get started. I will admit, it is helpful to know something about actual naval history to play this game. It is. But it's not necessarily required once you get a handle on the basics, either. In all honesty, although the AI sometimes builds very weird things. You can sometimes get an idea of what you should be doing by looking at what they're doing to some extent. But anyway, let's... Um... So here's the things you're going to need to be able to do. This is your starting fleet, right? 
every fleet consists of wow, that is horrifying design. Let me look. Here's a more functional battleship. Every fleet consists of fundamentally battleships, cruisers, and destroyers. Your battleships are your heavy tank slugging it out units. Later, there will be battle cruisers, which have which are glass cannons. Um, your heavy and light cruisers are basically either scouting units or anti-smaller cruiser units or anti-destroyer units. They fulfill a mid-sized role. And your destroyers fulfill a try-to-torpedo-the-battleships or die sort of role. And also a screening role against other destroyers. Um, so, on the strategic map here, we're the United States, as you can see. So we have three home areas where we can support an unlimited number of ships. Other than that, you can only support a limited number of ships based on the size of your holdings in other areas. However, you can move ships through at any time. If you need to move ships, what you do is... There's two ways to do it, actually. You can select any ship on here, and their location is listed here. And you can right-click and click move ships and move them over to here which whichever one you've clicked on will automatically be and select a destination and press OK and they'll move or alternatively you can click directly on the map at wherever they are hit move ships in area there's no ships in this area but uh, you can hit move ships in area select any ship or multiple ships with shift multiple ships with shift click and move them to wherever you want. And they'll do that on their own once you've selected that. It will take it takes one month of game time to proceed through each of these sea zones. How the map works is this collection of map areas or sea areas. There's only about what a dozen of them in total. Maybe one, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten, eleven, twelve. 13, 14, 15, 16, 17. Oh, where did I start? Well, there's about 20 in total anyway. <laughs> um, every one of them takes... It's fairly abstracted. Every one of them, it will take your ships exactly one month to move from one map area to any adjacent map area. The blue lines show adjacencies. Um, except for this one, which is not accurate yet at the start of the game, it takes until 1914 for the Panama Canal to be built. So... These are not actually adjacent yet, but they will be. And in time of war, what you'll have to do is try to protect your coasts and also move ships into any areas where enemy territories are in an effort to attack them. I'll show more of that if we get to a war section. But so that's how you des uh, move ships, right? Now let's go over a little bit of the interface here. Every ship has, in your fleet, you can double-click on it to get a... Those ships just horrify me by their appearance, I'm sorry. Every ship you can double-click on and get a better idea of what they're about. Over here, all right. First of all, you'll see what it is. You'll see its name, the name of its class, its displacement, which is how much it... Uh, Technically, is how much water it displaces, but is effectively how much it weighs. Its speed, which a knot will be very familiar to those who, of you who know something about navies. If you don't, just say it's about what one point. All right, before I say something stupid, let me Google it. But I would say a knot is about one point two miles an hour for general reference. It's one point one five. So not as just a little more than a mile an hour. They're fairly comparable. Most ships, these ships are atrociously slow that we're looking at right now. Most of your ships, you're going to want to go 16 knots or faster, even at the start. Cruisers are always going to be one. You're going to want to have them be 20 knots or faster. You can get a pretty solid idea of what's reasonable by looking at the ships the AI is building, because they usually build the pretty reasonable speeds. If you do want to look at what the AI is building, you can look at the Almanac here, uh, which presents a pretty good idea of um, 
a pretty good database of all the ships in the game, usually, plus some information on every country. Um, so if you select any of these countries and you click ships here, this tab, and then you can double click on any of their ships that are finished in the same as you can double click on one of yours and it'll come up with this same idea. This data is not always perfect. There's a little bit of fog of war, but it's generally accurate ish. And so you can get the Russian battleships are 14 knots, for instance. Um, aside from that, this will be the commanding officer of your ship that does sometimes have a big impact. But we'll get to that later. This will be the armament, your fire control, which is basically how you aim and direct your guns, and your armor. And there is more detail to that, but I'll get to that in a second when we talk about designing ships. So this whole tab about ships in service will list all of the ships in your fleet by type, name, and class, and it'll also give a quick rundown of their displacement, their speed, uh, their radar, which we don't have any of, their anti-submarine capabilities, the year they were built, where they are on the map, their status, which, all right, as good a time as any to go over that. AF stands for active fleet, which is sort of what you would expect. It means that they are sitting around being actively in your fleet, as opposed to any of these other options, which are, you can put them in reserve, which reduces maintenance, but also reduces crew quality, and they won't be able to fight in battles. You can put them in mothballs, which really reduces maintenance, but also pretty much reduces qual crew quality to zero, and they can't fight in battles. And it takes them a little while to work back up once you put them to active status. Uh, during war, you can put them on trade protection, which means they'll try to intercept enemy cruisers and prevent them from sinking your trade ships. Or raider, which is the opposite, which will have them try to sink enemy uh, merchant ships. And at any time, you can put them on foreign station, which basically means you'll see a requirement down here in the bottom left for required tonnage on foreign stations. It just says OK if you have enough. I know it doesn't say any of these ships are on foreign stations, but the ones that are in... There's two ways to put ships on foreign stations, which is to either click this to foreign station button and they'll do it automatically, or you can manually move them to the foreign stations in question a foreign station being any area that isn't one of your home areas. For us, the home areas are the West Coast, East Coast, and Caribbean. And... Not the Northern Pacific, actually, I don't think. Although, arguably, maybe it should be. But, um... Any area beyond that, you can see in this area overview, you'll get a list of foreign station requirements. We have to have 6,000 tons in the Central Pacific and 4,000 in the Northern Pacific because we have colonies there that would be considered potentially rebellious otherwise or just need protection. The consequence if you don't protect them will be that your government will get mad at you and they might rebel. Um, so that's your potential ship statuses. And then it'll list the quality of your crew, which ranges from like I've seen poor, I think there might be like terrible or very poor, all the way up to elite. Fair is basically your baseline or good, maybe. Uh, the maintenance cost per month of your ships, their armament. This is blockade value, which is just strictly a calculation for determining if you're blockading the enemy or not. Uh, and it's just based on the size of the ship. And the commanding officer. Almost a lot of it is the same data you get if you double click. There's a lot of ways to get data in this game. So, uh, let's take a quick look at a couple of the other things on this initial screen. We've seen the map, we've seen ships in service. This tab will show all of the ships that you're currently building. We are currently building none. I will fix that in a minute. Uh, this will show all of your submarines. You won't start. Well, depending on the date you start in, you might start with some. We haven't. Uh, submarines are largely automated in this game for the most part. Uh, they're not really modeled in great detail. Although it has improved with this game. Uh, coastal fortifications will show fixed batteries that you have in various locations on your coast. I don't usually worry about building any more of them after the start. 
but it's certainly an option, and they're very cheap per monthly maintenance. So if you feel your ports are threatened a lot, then it might be worth it. This sort of shows your former ships, which we have none of yet, but we will eventually. Uh, this shows the various areas of the world. And it shows, in essence, your basing capacity in each area. And the cost of the ships that you have in that area, the tonnage of your ships in the area, how much tonnage you need in the area. This is submarine operations value, which is basically how many submarines you can shove in without breaking, without uh, being unable to supply them properly. This tab is honestly pretty irrelevant. I don't know when the last time I actually checked this was, but uh, this will basically just show your basing capacity, your... Uh, okay, well, no, there's one reason to check this, which is mainly later on in the game when you have aircraft. But right now, you almost don't need to worry about it. But it shows your uh, base capacity, which is just measured against the size of your ships. Same as blockade value, I think. I think it is the same as your blockade value. And uh, the number of coastal batteries. Later, it will show your airfields. Officers are new to this game. They are... I'm going to sort them by rank. You can sort them any way you want. They are basically, you can fiddle with them a lot or not a lot, and it won't make a huge, huge difference. It tends to cost prestige to make changes. Uh, prestige is one of your sort of, it's your secondary currency, I guess you would say. Your main currency is just money. Um, but every captain has his own individual history of what ships he's commanded. And he has his own ability, which is like below average or incompetent, all the way up to average or above average, brilliant. Some of them have special abilities, which are usually just like, um, I don't know. Some of them are actual abilities and some of them are more like traits but they can cause unique events or they can affect how they fight in battle. Most of this can be handled automatically. The game will give you pop-ups about that. Or you can personally reassign your captains to ships as you build them or old captains retire and such, which does happen automatically. Otherwise, on this screen, you'll see down here, Prestige. The main thing is... This is this used to be sort of just your score. It does count for a little bit more now than now that you can spend it to reassign officers. So you can get incompetent officers off of your ships by spending prestige. But essentially, you can't let this fall below 16, as it says there, or you'll get fired eventually. There will be a lot of random events that increase it. Winning battles also increases it. Or random events can decrease it, um, depending on the choices you make, though. Fleet morale is mostly defined by how well you do in battles. Dock size. This is a critical thing. Currently, this 8,000 means that the largest ship we can build ourselves is 8,000 tons. As you can see, we already have several ships of 7,200 tons. Ships will get rapidly larger during the game. You will get some free dock size from private investments, but honestly, I usually recommend you pretty much just start building larger docks immediately. It will cost you some budget, it takes a year of lead time, and you get 1,000 tons at a time. You don't necessarily need to be continuously building new docks for the whole game, but you probably need to get them up to 15 or 20,000 tons almost immediately. Shipyard capacity is the total tonnage of ships you can build at one time. So if dock size is the largest single ship you can build, shipyard capacity is the maximum total build capacity. I haven't really found it to be a problem. It will probably only be a problem if you lose half your fleet in a battle and then have so much surplus budget that you can't build ships fast enough. But most of the time, you can't build ships fast enough to really exceed this. This value is usually irrelevant, but it will rise if you're 
country comes under blockade or if you consistently choose options that don't care very much about the population, if it reaches 10, your government might be overthrown in a revolution, which is bad. Build requirements come sometimes because your politicians order you to do stuff because they're jerks. Um, you can't ignore them. It will just cost you prestige. Uh, treaty limits only come up if a naval disarmament treaty is signed, which does definitely happen. Sometimes you usually have the option to shoot it down to some extent, uh, but sometimes it happens anyway. If you do, it'll list the restrictions here. This column, this whole column, is essentially your budget. This will be how much you have to spend per year, per month. This is how much you're actually spending on maintenance and on construction and on research and other things. Mostly these exact values don't matter that much unless you're, you want to do some really advanced planning on how much you'll be able to afford in the future, etc., etc. Frankly, these two numbers right here are what you really need to look at. And as long as you keep a close eye on them, the other numbers are pretty irrelevant. This is how much money you're making or losing per month that will turn red if you're losing money. This is how much money you actually have in the bank. You can run a very significant monthly deficit, and it doesn't matter at all as long as you have money in the bank to afford it. However, if both of these go into the red, you'll probably get fired by the angry president slash monarch of your country for violating his budget rules. What else? Uh, I'll get into design and build ships in a second. Over here, otherwise, you'll see this research tab, which basically just lists a number of areas of research. You'll get more and more of these, such as like aircraft and submarines as the game goes on. You can choose your priority for each one of these. I like to prioritize fire control myself uh, because accuracy will be extremely important to you as the game goes on, you will find. But it's entirely your call. Some of the most critical things are fire control, which will be in this tab. Every new big fire control system, make sure to install on your ships immediately. They are extremely powerful upgrades. Probably the single best in the game. Ship design will give you things such as new ways to mount turrets on your ships and layouts and things like that, and can also be extremely helpful. But all of these less dramatic upgrades, a lot of these will be like 1% weight savings or etc. That adds up a lot when you're building multi-thousand ton ships. That's sort of how the march of technology over the game will allow you to build things even using otherwise basic tech that are much better on the same tonnage than you would at the start of the game. Uh, there is a separate sub-tab for naval guns that shows you sort of the quality of every caliber of gun you have, uh, because better guns are researched individually, independently of each other. So for instance, our 12-inch guns are minus 2 quality, the, because it's 1890, zero, like these all are, is sort of the baseline quality. It goes up to, I believe, plus two. If you double-click on them, you'll get this armor penetration table, which basically gives you a guide. Um, technically, it's pretty precise, but there is some randomization. This is basically a guideline to how much armor this gun will penetrate at a given range. Uh, the ranges are all in yards here, although for the European audience slash all non-Americans, yards are pretty close to meters, so you can consider them a little bit interchangeable in your head. Um, research, other than, if you right-click, you can choose high, medium, or low priority for any individual category. If you just set everything to high, then nothing will be high, that's how that works, so pick what you have you have to pick what you want to prioritize the only thing you can really do to affect your research other than that is change this research budget here frankly i would probably recommend you just max it out technology is you extremely important in this game a 10 year old ship will usually be thoroughly annihilated by a brand new ship 
because of how rapidly technology changes over the course of this game. So I would always advise trying to be as much at the forefront as possible. Uh, this tab, Doctrine, honestly, I would mostly leave it alone unless you really know what you're doing. Uh, the only things that are really relevant for a beginner here is these training priorities. Frankly, while you're at peace, you should leave none of these checked because they're pretty expensive in maintenance. However, when you go to war, or if you think you're about to go to war, checking one or two of these, such as gunnery, or uh, we can't check damage control because it's tech, but gunnery, or torpedo warfare, or damage control, it increases maintenance, but it also makes your ships pretty considerably better at whatever you've checked. Uh, I believe you can only pick two, unfortunately, but um, it's, I think, definitely worth running these while you're at war. Just don't forget to uncheck them afterwards, because they are pretty expensive to run. And they take 12 months to come into effect, as you can see here. So try to do it a little bit before you go to war if you really think you're going to go to war. Uh, other tabs here, these messages basically just list sort of a lot of... You'll get a bunch of messages every turn. Most of them are sort of irrelevant. As you can see, it's basically telling us everything we know that the AI powers are doing. For the most part, what you know, any individual ship laid down by an AI power is not really that relevant. But you can certainly keep a close eye on what they're doing, both through these messages and through looking at the almanac, which will list every ship in detail on this tab. And here, this is sort of a general overview of how powerful every navy is in terms of, you know, number of battleships in service and building and etc. for all the categories. Mobilization here, this is just your free button to, if you have a lot of ships in reserve and mothballed, and you don't want to go through and put them all on active fleet manually when you go to war. You can just slap this button and activate all of them. I think all are small active, so that's... Or you can put every ship in reserve with this button. I honestly, objectively, may be a good idea when you're not at war. But you have to be very careful not to be caught napping when you do go to war, and you don't necessarily have much control over that. There are some big things in this game that you don't have control over. I mentioned the only way you can really affect research is by changing your budget. Research is in more or research is semi random. That doesn't mean that you're going to randomly get surface to air missiles in 1890. You won't. For the most part, everything within a category is either in order or just like maybe one or two places out of order of when it was discovered historically. But Every individual tech basically just has a random chance per turn to be unlocked. The only thing you can do to change that is prioritization of an area or your general research budget. And they all have internally sort of a year, I believe, that they're supposed to be unlocked, but then that just starts the random timer for them to be unlocked. Uh, similarly, going to war is not really under your control in this game. You've got to think of yourself as playing like the High Admiral or Secretary of the Navy or some such. You can make some important decisions. Uh, I'll try to get a random event in a minute that'll show you some of those. But you're not controlling everything. You're not the president. You don't decide when you go to war. Um, this is how you put f ships in divisions. What divisions do is it has ships try to operate together. So you can select, for instance, sure, first battle division. This would be for battleships that you want to operate together. And then what you do is you click, you right click, mostly you right click if you want to open things in this game, and you select, say, all the ships of a certain speed or a certain class, and you put them all in here together. The main reason to do that is because, let's say you have some battleships that go 17 knots and some battleships that go 13 knots, like we do here. You don't want battleships, you don't want the two of them to be together when you load into a battle. 
you want the 17 knot ones to be in one formation and the 13 knot ones to be in another formation. And putting them in divisions sort of tells the game that. Because if they are all in the same formation, the whole formation will only be able to go 13 knots, which is a problem. Fleet exercise. This is mainly... Um, Honestly, it's mainly if you're bored. It does improve crew readiness, I believe, but it costs a good deal of money. And basically what you can do is take all the ships in your fleet, assign them to two sides, and have them fight each other, simulated, sort of. A.K.A. a fleet exercise. Uh, but it's pretty. it's not free to run, so... I don't know that I would usually recommend it unless you're bored. Uh, the history thing here is just a bunch of cool stats that you can see. We can't actually see any of them now because nothing's happened. But uh, it'll show your prestige and when you fought wars and everybody's fleet tonnage and everybody's economy and how many ships everyone has lost. Preferences here. I wouldn't really recommend messing with them for the most part. Obviously, you can do whatever you want with like your sound video, etc. But... Uh, Some of these you can mess with. Okay, the big one, probably. A lot of these are basically related to how many messages you get during battles. And how often the battles pause themselves. Other than that... The critical setting here is really your realism setting. Admiral's mode will have it so that you can only control sort of sort of your whole fleet. Like, you issue, issue general orders to whole, to your whole formation from whatever is in range of your command ship. Rear Admiral's mode is the default. It lets you control ships by division, which is, that is, you order formations of usually two to four ships around, as long as they're in range of your command ship. Captain's mode is the most, um, you control every ship individually in captain's mode, and it doesn't matter if they're in spotting range of your command ship or not. Uh, rear admiral's mode is the default for a reason. Admiral's row mode will probably be fairly frustrating to play if you're a new player. Captain's mode is... is abusable, mainly. If you can control every ship individually, it's sometimes a little too easy to gank the AI with torpedoes and such. Rear Admiral's mode is probably the best mode to run on, but, of course, personal preference. Aside from that, the last thing I want to go over on this screen is, well, Intel reports will tell you some important things. Sometimes we don't have any yet. And then, Relations. This is effectively the game's sort of war-slash-diplomacy system. This chart here with all of the AI powers, shows your, is, this bar is showing your tension with each of them. Uh, it will be affected every turn by random events, and it will change darker and darker from green to red as it goes up. When it reaches 10, which is represented by this line here, you have a chance every turn of going to war with them. It can go above 10, and the chance will go even higher, but usually if it reaches that line, it will start a war within a couple of months. Every turn is one month. You press this turn button, it advances time by one month. January 1890, we get our turn messages, which will tell you things like, this captain's been promoted to rear admiral, people are laying ships down, there's communications lags sometimes, not always. It gets fixed as you get better tech. And then it's another month, you have more funding or less, depending how your balance is. This is ticked down a month, any construction we'll have, etc. And there's been maybe a couple of random changes here. It doesn't happen every turn. Many turns you'll get uh, messages with, or that is, you'll get random events that occur that allow you to make choices that will impact tensions or your prestige or your budget. Uh, that's up to your judgment, usually. This being a war game, fundamentally, you pick choices that increase tensions, which tend to also increase your budget and your prestige. Uh, the only time you don't want to do that is if it would cause a war with someone that you're really not prepared to fight. 
So now, okay. Let's take a look at the ship design system. And we'll take a look at a pre-dreadnought battleship. Now you can design this completely from scratch. Including you can take graphics and put all sorts of superstructure stuff on here. I don't even fully know how to do this myself. But you can design the whole layout of your ship from scratch. However, it's pretty complicated to do all that. And as you can see, this screen is pretty complicated already. What I would really recommend is you just hit auto design ship of selected type right here. Let it auto design a ship. And then you can modify what it comes up with uh, to your personal specifications. So here's the key factors on here. Displacement is very important. I know just weight doesn't sound that important. And technically it's not, except it defines um, how big a ship is, and it defines how expensive a ship is. How expensive a ship is is mostly defined by how much it weighs, combined a little bit with what type it is. Uh, by fast ships, like battle cruisers, tend to be more expensive per ton than slow ships. But uh, basically cost is a function of weight and type. Uh, it won't let you, because the game's battle generation is dependent on knowing what type of ship you are, uh, it won't really let you, if you do something that's wildly incorrect for this type, it will just refuse to let you build it, so you can't, you can mess with it some, but not too much. Uh, then the critical fight should be on that freeboard. That will cause your ships to be worse or better in various weather types. Most of your ships are going to want to be normal freeboard if you're in any sort of actual open ocean. The only time I would recommend low freeboard is if maybe you're Austria-Hungary or Italy and you're never leaving the Mediterranean. Um, range, sort of similar. I don't find that long range is necessarily super helpful, but it is if you're building a dedicated raiding or colonial ship. Those are basically the two reasons. Short range is actually to be avoided at all costs, because short-range ships cannot be moved from map area to map area while you're at war. They can in peacetime, because presumably they make use of neutral ports, or... Yeah, neutral ports mainly. Maybe at sea refueling sometimes, but... Uh, medium is really the range you're going to want most of your ships to be. I really wouldn't recommend building short-range ships unless... Again, you're one of those powers that can just absolutely sit in one map area. Now, engine priority. Normal is going to be what you want most of your ships to be on. Speed is good for things like destroyers that you're going to have a lot of. And it doesn't really matter if one or two of them are broken at any one time. Or just break down mid-battle even. It's more important that they're fast. Reliability is maybe what you want for like a colonial service cruiser. Or something else that's going to be overseas a lot of the time. Uh, this all sounds very complicated and never even really spells out what it is, I just realized. But, uh, all of these settings are armor in inches. This is the thickness of your armor belt. That effectively means... Well, belt is a fairly descriptive term. It's basically a, the line of armor running all the way around the sides of your ship. Uh, sometimes it's not actually all the way around. In fact, in a lot of schemes, it's not. It just leaves a uh, the center protected and not really the sides, but it's basically a belt. Um, for destroyers, will usually have almost no armor. Light cruisers will have maybe two to three inches. Armored cruisers will have, or heavy cruisers as they later become, will have sort of four inches plus. The AI will sometimes build battleships with really little armor. Personally, I wouldn't actually advise you to build a battleship with less than 10 inches of armor if you could possibly help it. And most of my own, I have like 12 plus inches on. Uh, this defines belt coverage, so you can build thicker or narrower belts. Also, extensions and upper belts, which are just sort of proportions of your belt. Uh, this depends a little bit on your armor scheme. It can be very complicated. 
I would advise sort of taking what it auto generates and modifying it in proportion to what you change the belt to. A deck then is the armor that you'll have. Okay, if belt is sort of your side armor, deck is your top armor. It is inevitably going to be much thinner because, okay, look at this uh, weight margin here. Watch what horrifying thing happens if I try to put 10 inches of deck armor on here. Yeah. Deck armor is really heavy. Much heavier, actually, even than belt armor is. Yeah, see? If I change belt armor down to 2,000 or 2 inches, it only saves about 1,500 tons. Uh, compared to deck armor, which just added about 4,500 tons by increasing it that much. Two inches is probably fine for a battleship in this era. Uh, in fact, the ratio between these changes over time. If we look at gun data again, uh, which you can click over here at the gun section to see. Guns right now in 1890 penetrate actually not that much belt armor because they're just generally bad, but they penetrate much, much more belt armor than they do deck armor, and they only have a limited range. That's a pretty logical thing because... In essence, deck armor is only relevant against plunging fire. That is to say, if a ship is shooting directly at the side of your ship at what we would call a normal close range that people picture ships as fire fighting at, then their shells will hit the side, which is the belt, and your deck will never do anything. And guns in 1890 pretty much never actually plunge or are at enough of an angle to really hit the deck. However, later on, as we get radar and advanced fire controls and bigger guns, battleship guns especially, but also other guns, will start to plunge more and more, which means they get fired at something like a 45, 30, 40 degree angle, and then come down in a big arc from above, and those have a much higher tendency to hit the deck. As with, at which point you're going to need more and more deck armor in order to stop them from wrecking your ship. Uh, beyond that, the conning tower is basically your your bridge, or really it's your battle bridge, so to speak. It's where your captain will go uh, during battle because this isn't 1750, and they'll be well. Per it can have a lot of armor that, without costing very much weight. And the better armored it is, the less likely you are to have your command crew wiped out by a lucky shot mid-battle. Turret armor is separate. is basically the same principle as belt and deck, but it's separate for turrets. Turrets need to be very well armored also, because, especially in the early game, before you get better protections for it, if they get penetrated, it can cause what's called a flash fire, which is basically when... Okay, so the turrets are where the guns are. The ammunition is not all inside the turrets, but there is some ammunition inside the turrets when you're in battle because it's being loaded into the guns. If the turret gets penetrated and a shell explodes inside it, it will set off the ammunition that's inside the turret, probably blowing the turret off or to pieces, and the fire will go down the uh, shaft or hoist that brings ammunition up from the magazines into the turret, into the magazines, and cause your whole ship to blow up. So armoring your turrets well is sort of a must. Secondary guns don't usually cause magazine explosions, so I think it's possible, but it's fairly unlikely. However, they can get taken out more easily if they're not well armored as well. So this is your armor. It adds a lot of weight. It's very necessary for, well, battleships. Uh, these are your armor schemes. You'll unlock sort of better ones as the game goes on. All or Nothing is the archetypal late battleship armor scheme but we don't have that yet. Uh, the all-or-nothing principle, for those of you who aren't familiar with naval history, is basically that you armor an area of the ship that, in the center, you calculate it out so that everything to the sides or outside of that area can get completely shot up and flooded with water, and that won't be enough to sink the ship. It has to penetrate... Um, Enemy shells have to penetrate the protected center citadel in order to sink the ship. Hence why it's called all or nothing. It basically doesn't waste armor protecting on essential areas of the ship. 
Um, aside from that, torpedo defense. You don't have any at the start of the game if you're starting in 1890. But I'm going to tell you it's absolutely vital. There's pretty much no reason that a capital ship should ever have... By a capital ship, I mean a battleship or a battle cruiser or an aircraft carrier. I really wouldn't advise you to build any capital ship ever with less than just the maximum amount of torpedo defense that you have unlocked. Because at the start of the game, with zero torpedo defense, one torpedo will frequently just annihilate a capital ship in a single hit will cause either catastrophic flooding or an out outright magazine explosion or something. Um, but torpedo defense makes your ships progressively much tankier against destroyer against torpedoes to the point that a battleship with say torpedo defense four can usually take several torpedo hits and only barely be inconvenienced by it. It does cost quite a bit of weight. I don't think this is reflective of, how much weight it actually costs, because we don't have it unlocked. Oh, oh, it's also maybe because... Interesting. Maybe five is just broken. It does cost quite a lot of weight, but it is almost certainly worth it, at least on capital ships. Honestly, anything cruiser or above should have at least some torpedo protection once you have it unlocked. Guns. Basically, uh, these three sections here... No, all of these other sections here, actually, all four of them, are basically just guns, weapons. Upper left here will be your main guns. You can lay them out in, for almost all ships, they're going to be in several turrets. At the start of the game, if you start in 1890, they're going to be probably in two turrets fore and aft, because that's how ships tended to look in 1890. Later on, as you get to what's called dreadnoughts, You'll have up to four turrets on the center line, actually sometimes even more, and you can put more guns in each turret uh, to the tune of that horribly broke how that looked. That's better. You can put more guns in each turret to the tune of three guns per turret. Four guns per turret is even possible, although... Well, it is... I don't, I'm not going to say it's unrecommended. It's definitely possible. Uh, right now, if I try to do it, and I check this check design button, it will tell me all kinds of problems, but it will tell me triple turrets now researched, so I can't do it. Also, it will tell me I haven't researched TPS. This, If you press this check design button, it will tell you all the things that it thinks are wrong with your ship from like a technical standpoint or a game standpoint, basically. Um, this is where you control what fire control you have. Right now, we have local only because we haven't developed any. Uh, once you unlock some new one, it will automatically be available here. Always select the newest one at the bottom. There, It's very light for the most part, and it provides an enormous advantage in accuracy. Fire. This is fire control positions. You should probably have at least two on any ship because you should have a backup. Because uh, you will lose a lot of accuracy if they're all destroyed. Personally, I like to go with three sometimes on a lot of ships. Uh, however, it doesn't actually matter if you have local only. And as a, you can see, it adds no weight. I can add infinite. Oh, three is the max, but uh, yeah. Uh, this, by the way, you might have just seen me change this. This is strictly an aesthetic thing. It has no actual game impact. It just changes how the turrets look over here. Uh, apparently, because nobody had triple turrets in the Victorian era, there's not a good working model for what that looks like. But... Uh, if you go to any of the later turret designs, that works. <laughs> this is your anti-aircraft guns. It's not relevant right now, uh, but it's a pretty simple system. You add directors, which are basically the equivalent of fire control for AA guns. And you add as many light and AA guns as you can actually fit on your top side. This is um, This little number here is basically how many AA guns and how many other things you can physically fit on the top of the ship. There is almost no reason to ever have less AA guns than you have unlocked per technology and can physically fit on the ship because planes are a problem. This is your second... Okay, I should so show you how you add more turrets. Um, you smash this add turret button here and you click... This is going to look confusing. You'll sort of have to learn by experimentation what each of these letters and or numbers stands for starboard of course is right port is left aft is the back 
bow is the front. But if you ever want to see, you can just basically click one of these. You can select what type of turret you want. A casemate is like a uh, non-rotating turret, really. Uh, you can select what type of turret you want, and you can press OK, and it will, yeah, it will tell you you can't do what I just did because we haven't invented it, but it will slap an additional turret on in wherever that position is. Um, this will be no surprise to any of you who really know how naval technology works, but if you happen to be somebody who doesn't, what you want is center line turrets, aka turrets that are all in the center line of the ship here, because they can fire on both sides of the ship easily uh, by rotating. Turrets that are on the side, like this one that I just put on here, can only fire off to the side that um, that they're on. For obvious reasons, this whole structure here is your bridge and such, and you cannot fire through it. There is such a thing as cross-deck fire, for which there's a checkbox here, and that basically is a pretty elaborate scheme where you build say, whoops, one turret here, and one turret here, and you deliberately leave your bridge sort of smooshed in between them, so that a turret that's here can aim off to this side, or off to this side, that if you're at about exactly a 90 degree angle to your enemy, that only makes sense, like, don't do that if you have four or more centerline turrets unlocked, but there is a brief period when it kind of makes sense. Because you will unlock putting turrets on the sides before you will unlock putting turrets in the middle. For technological reasons, which was true to life. Anyway, secondary guns are a little simpler, and tertiary guns are the same as secondary guns. You don't really pick... Well, you can actually pick the exact locations they go via the graphics and such... Uh, but in general, it's fine to let it automatically place them. I haven't seen it do anything really egregious. In essence, you pick here the caliber of the gun you want. Typically, secondary guns are maybe... For most of the game, secondary guns are sort of 5-6 inches or less. There is a brief period at which, in the, say the late 1890s to early 1900s, where you will have where you will be able to build bigger and bigger battleships, but you won't have unlocked extra turret locations for them beyond these two. And at that point, it historically and in-game makes sense sometimes to just pile, you know, 8-inch secondary turrets on, or even bigger sometimes. And that's valid, but it's only valid for that brief period. Most of the game, 5-6 inches or less... And then your tertiary guns will be, you know, two or three inches. And those are for... On a battleship like this, your secondary guns are basically for anti-cruiser duties, and your tertiary guns are for anti-destroyer duties. Although, they sort of can do either or, of course, but yeah. Uh, so you just control their caliber with this... Uh bar here, I don't know what you call this exactly, and you control the number of them here. It's not uncommon to see as many as like 20 on later battleships, that's too many for an early battleship like this. It all comes down to what you can afford, and how much you can fit on a reasonably sized hull. Um, by doing this you can set how many guns per turret, which can save weight and make them more efficient. Uh, but you don't necessarily always have it unlocked at the start. Aside from that, this, in additional armament here, is where you add or delete torpedoes. It's by the same process as guns. Uh, a ship like this can only have submerged torpedoes, which are not useless, but are very limited. However, destroyers can have uh, torpedo mounts above the water, which are much more effective. Later on in the game, this is also where you can adjust things like anti-submarine weapons, radar, uh, maybe put seaplane hangers or a flight deck if you're building an aircraft carrier. Catapults are also for carriers. Missile launchers is a very late game thing for if you're, well, if you're installing missile launchers. Um, 
hopefully if you get to that date, you'll understand what to do with it, basically. But it's the same principle as any of these other weapons that you can add in. So essentially the job is here on this screen is to design a ship for whatever purpose you have in mind. I've been basically showing how to design a functional line battleship, let's call it. Um, it's not actually not really possible to build one on 8,000 tons. So let me very quickly show what I would consider, say, a functional armored cruiser of this era. If I let it auto-design... This is not terrible, just for the reference of anyone. This is a fairly reasonable design, and the AI is not terrible at auto-designing. However, sometimes it will throw out some really weird things, and oftentimes you might have to go through and make sure that it's not actually done anything weird with your range or your freeboard or etc. Oh, I forgot about accommodations. Uh, basically what it says in the tooltip there, if your ships are going to stay only like in your home ports forever, then cramped might be all right. However, if they're going to need to move about from sea zone to sea zone, then you need at least normal most of the time. If they're going to be on colonial duties away from port forever, then probably maybe think about spacious. Uh, all these long-range things for colonial stuff does cost a lot of weight, though. It'll definitely hurt the combat performance of your ship for its size. Okay, so let's say I like this ship. There's probably some fine-tuning that could be done, but it's not bad. All of these figures, 20 knots, 4 inches belt armor, 4 8-inch guns, 6 10-inch guns, secondaries, these are all very reasonable for an armored cruiser in 1890. So let's say I like it well enough. Uh, you can choose its class name right here. You can type anything or it'll suggest something. Based on real class names, if you're done, you can hit check design here. These two errors that come up are, are sort of inevitable for this era, and there are some that are like that. Basically, this says you can't put turret guns. You can't put guns in turrets, main guns, less than 9 inches, without taking a 10% rate of fire penalty. That's just because technology doesn't let you. It's not like a you-can't-do-this thing. It's just that this isn't as good as if you get the technology later on. However, to add 9-inch guns costs a lot of weight. It's actually doable. So just to show you how you would clear that error is you click here, up this from 8 to 9-inch guns. That will cause your weight remaining... Alright, I did miss something here. The fundamental thing here is this total is the price of your ship. This is the weight. This is how much it's going to cost in your funds down here. This is how much weight you have left. This needs to be a positive number or very, very close to a positive number. But it's actively bad for it to be more positive than it needs to be. That is, what you're targeting is like 0 to maybe 50 or something. Because... Any weight that's in the positive is sort of wasted weight. This is free space compared to your displacement that's not doing anything. However, if it goes negative, like it will if I do this, then your ship will become unstable and unseaworthy and will be more easily sunk. So what you want is a very slightly positive value, which means you have a stable ship with a very limited amount of wasted space. And the way you adjust your displacement, by the way, is you just click these. This adjusted by 100s, this adjusted by 500s. Usually, how I like to do it is get my ship statistics, you know, my speed, my armor, guns, etc. Set those up, and then adjust my displacement so as to get the weight to just this slightly positive value. However, if you're very budget-minded and you have, like, an exact cost in mind... You can set it to a displacement that will cost roughly that amount. And then you can work within that as you set all your stats and make sure you keep the weight remaining 
two about that number that you want. So now it says all okay because I've upped it to nine inch guns. I wouldn't necessarily actually recommend you do that, eh, but there's nothing wrong with it either. It's just heavier and less efficient and nine inch guns aren't that much better than eight inch guns. So then once it passes all okay here, you can press save and finish down here. It'll come up with pretty much the same check again. So you can also just press save and finish to check it. Uh, but then you've got to remember to press cancel if you don't like what the check comes up with. So then you press OK. It'll tell you, do you want to start developing the design for construction? It costs a decent little amount of money just to develop the design. So you don't want to... Well, here's what you can do, actually. Let me press no for a second. You can design as many ships as you want and just hit... Well, you hit this button, and the design should be saved, I believe. I'm second-guessing myself, but I think if you do press this button, then the design will be saved, and you can open it again from out of this folder. Yeah. So then you can click on... Yeah, Brooklyn was just saved because I pressed the save and finish design. You can click open, it'll load the design up. And you can press, and you can build it again. So you can design as many ships as you want, save them without actually developing them for construction, if you just want to experiment. But when you actually want to build a ship, you have to get this, you have to pay this price and wait this time, and then you'll be able to actually build the ship. And it'll come up with design study here. So I'll just wait. I'm going to hit yes to all on that. That's, oh, our relations with Spain. So this is an example of a random event you can get. Our relations with Spain is taking a sudden turn for the worse. This is one of the most, um, how to put it, a, a, a dangerous events because it is extremely random and it will just cause your tension with one country to skyrocket. Uh, this is one of those things that will cost you prestige because we have too few armored cruisers. This, however, is one of the things that's good. If your tensions with somebody are high, then the country will sometimes give you more money to spend. So as you can see, our tensions with Spain just shot through the roof because of that random event. Why are there... Oh, because I moved a bunch of ships randomly around to show you guys how to do it. Since I'm not planning to actually play this, I'm just going to put all of our cruisers onto foreign stations, or all of our light cruisers, and that should satisfy that requirement. Okay. So let's just wait for this design study to be finished. You should probably be doing uh, designing other ships, etc. Our budget is hugely positive. Uh, here's another random event. Here's an example of one that actually provides you choices. A spy from Russia has been discovered. So you can either give it publicity or handle it discreetly. If it has an effect on anything, it will come up as this tooltip here. So if we give it publicity, we will increase tension and we will probably, that's what the parentheses mean, with the brackets, we will probably get a budget increase. And we will definitely cause Russia to be more angry with us. If we handle it quietly, nothing will happen. If you're not at the brink of war with somebody, there's really very little reason not to do this just for the potential of a budget increase. All right, so now our design is ready for construction. You can just ignore it, or you can immediately redesign it, or you can go to the build screen, which will bring up this. This is the same as what will happen. In fact, I'll just demonstrate. This is exactly the same as what will happen if you press build ship here. This will list all of your ship designs made in... Ooh, I'm not sure, actually. I think it shows all of your ship designs made in the last five years or so. If you want to see older ship designs, you can just check this button, which, oh yeah, it is five years. You can just check this button and it'll show every ship you've ever designed. Uh, it's also showing every ship that was generated for our starting fleet right now, in case we wanted to build more of them. But okay, we select Brooklyn, and you can name it yourself, or you can hit Suggest. It's always going to suggest Brooklyn right now because the first ship of the class is traditionally 
That is, we named the class the Brooklyn class. Traditionally, the class is named after the first ship of the class. So it's always going to want the first ship of the class to be named Brooklyn if we named it the Brooklyn class. You see what I'm saying there? Anyway, this will list out the total cost of the ship, how many months it will take to build, uh, how much maintenance it will cost once it's built, and then how much it will cost per month. Usually, honestly, this is the critical figure, at least the way I figure my budgets, because you can look at your monthly balance here, subtract this number from it, roughly, in your head. You can say we'll have about 3250 positive still after we build one of these, or we can build two, and it'll list... Uh, it still lists it per ship here, and then on the right it will list for however many ships you're having built. So we could afford to build four of these right now, and we would dip very slightly into the red, but we have a lot of funds to cover it, so let's do that. Why not? So now we're building four of these cruisers. Our monthly balance is slightly in the red, but until our funds also dip into the red, that's not a problem at all. In fact, you're really encouraged to be as close to zero as you can, because it's just wasted money if you're not. There's no point in hoarding money. In fact, if you do hoard money too much, the government will step in and take it away from you. Like, they'll cut your budget, which is bad. So spend your money as you've got it. You can hoard it a little bit. As you can see, I just stockpiled, like... Uh, it's kind of hard to say what this is supposed to represent. We'll say represent, we'll say maybe 16 million or something is maybe what that's supposed to be. I stockpiled that without causing any problem, but if you went too much further, the governments might start getting angry. Oh, here's another example of a random event. This one can cause either such a internal upheaval in Southern Korea. Japan is sending a force there. This means that if we do nothing, Japan will probably annex South Korea. Uh, but our options can cause more or less tension. Uh, this is sort of the neutral option, and it causes Japan to not annex South Korea at the cost of our tension with them going up a bit. Now, the only other thing left to show you really is what happens when we get into a battle. I'm going to basically fast forward until we get into a battle. I'll see you guys in a minute. Okay, so by slamming every increased tension button I could in random events, I managed in about a year to start a war with Germany. Um, although you don't control when you go to war, if you continuously pick the most warmongering options, you will usually get into a war. What's really difficult is to sort of manipulate which country you go to war with. I originally assumed a year ago that we would go to war with Spain, but it has ended up being Germany. Now, I think we're also going to go, war, go to war with Spain, so that's fun. But, uh, in fact, oh, yeah, wow, okay. So we're at war with Germany and Spain. That's fine. I'm going to do nothing because I just want to show you how battles work. But I would highly advise, in fact, I'm going to do one thing, which is I'm going to move everything to the Caribbean where all the Spanish ships will be. Uh... I would highly advise, basically, that you lay your ships out so as basically to target areas where you and the enemy both have territories, if any of those exist. If they don't, then you'll have to basically protect your coasts and send ships out to raid. Uh, you can manually trigger invasions, which is an important thing to know, actually. Uh, if you click a territory that's within... You have a limit on your invasion range, and it's pretty strict at the start of the game, but Cuba, for instance, is very close. You click on Cuba on this map, which you can zoom in and out of. You click Cuba, you hit the set invasion target button. Over here, there will be this invasion planning thing. It costs you a little bit per month. And in a couple of months, you will invade Cuba. If you conquer it, you just get to keep it. And you get all the accompanying bases and some income... And, you know, maybe oil if it's got that, and etc. Uh, that's one of the major ways to take territories. The other way is that in a peace treaty at the end of the war, if you won the war, you'll get to select some territories to take based on a points system. Um, you'll see over here it says how many ships you need to have on trade protection duties. 
I'm just going to throw a bunch of random ships on trade protection duties because it will get really mad at me if I don't. Uh, but you should really build. That's the purpose of ships like these Corvettes that you may have noticed we have. They're useless for anything else. Later in the game, once you unlock them, I would generally recommend just using destroyers for trade protection to satisfy this quota. But that's what those are for. All right. Okay. So this is what it looks like when a battle happens. This isn't what the actual battle looks like, but you'll get this pop up that says, in essence, this is the location of the battle. This is the type of battle, aka a cruiser action. Uh, this is who you're fighting. This is the size, which is related to the type that it is. Basically, medium probably means it'll be between cruisers. Small means it'll be... Sorry. Small means it'll be mainly destroyers, and large means that there will be a lot of battleships involved. Um, these battles are sort of semi-randomly generated. You will get ones that are specifically related to invasions, etc. Um, but otherwise, they're generated in areas where both sides of a war have ships, and where ships of certain types are. I mean, you'll obviously get battleship actions if you both have battleships there, and so on. You can decline almost any battle, unless you get what they call like unexpected battles, where you just blunder into each other. Most of the time, you can just keep your ships in port if you want, uh, but it will give the enemy victory points. Victory points are how wars are decided. Whoever has more at the end wins the war. Um, you get victory points basically by sinking enemy ships, winning battles, uh, sinking merchants through raiding, and potentially through blockading the enemy, which you basically do by moving your whole fleet into their home sector, and if your fleet is bigger than theirs, then they'll be blockaded automatically. However, you have to actually have bases to support your fleet there, or it will end poorly. Um, the alternative way to winning... Most wars will be decided by victory points. If you can keep a war going long enough and win it enough then the enemy country might just collapse completely regardless of the victory point balance, in which case you get the maximum possible concessions. So I'm going to hit accept. Oh, and the Spanish declined. Okay, well. I'm going to fast forward until I get them to actually accept a battle, and... Oh, for God's sake. Okay, so that's an example of the sad things that can happen. Um, because peace is also random, even when I choose the most aggressive option, sometimes you'll just get peace, unfortunately. So I'm just going to spam forwards again until we actually get in a battle. See that? All right. Great news. I realized that I could just set up a fleet exercise to show you what a battle looks like. So I took two of our battleships to be our side, blue team, or maybe we're red team, I don't know. Probably we're blue team. I took two enemy battle, two other of our battle, two of our other battleships to be the red four, and we're just going to fight a mock battle so I can show you how it looks. This is essentially, battles are fought on this gigantic globe. Technically, you can sail anywhere in the world during a battle, but in practice, you're not going to sail that far because there's a time limit, uh, which is listed here. This is in minutes. Uh, zero is how much time has gone by. 800 is the time limit. After 800 minutes, the battle will pretty much end. If you're actually in combat shooting at each other still after 800 minutes, it will keep going until you're not. The hard cap is like 50% more, like 1,200 minutes. But essentially, if you're not in combat at the moment of 800 minutes passing, it will end. Uh, right here, you can see your order of battle. And then all of these buttons at the top, very, um, I realize they all look a little confusing. It's not really that bad. At the bottom, this will show you your coordinates, the date and time. The, the only thing that is really relevant there is the local time, which controls whether it's day or night. It's entirely possible and frequently happens that it becomes either day or night mid-battle, which will cause visibility to drastically fall or uh, rise, and you can see sort of this dynamic distance measurer from 
whatever your selected ship is. Now, all of these things up here, these are just your basic save buttons, your end game button, which is basically your resign button at this point. You can change preferences. You can zoom in and out without using mouse wheel scroll, which is what I'm doing. I don't see why you would. Well, if you have a trackpad or something, then that's how you zoom in and out. You can zoom specifically to your ships if you lose track of them. This is for missile control. You can lock. These all basically just toggle different overlays. This is the sighting range. I typically keep that on because it's really helpful to know what your sighting range is. It's these gray dashed lines. This is your main gun range. It's red dashed lines. Also a really handy thing to have up most of the time. This is torpedo range. These ships don't have torpedoes, so it doesn't appear. If they did, it would be blue dashed lines, probably about this big right now. This is radar range, also doesn't appear. Would be green lines, but we don't have radar. Same with air and missile ranges, we don't have those yet. Fire ranges, uh, fire lines will show up when the actual fighting starts. You can have this inset up here. I don't really know why you would want it, but you can certainly have it. And you can show whether or not to show, you can click to show the division names and ship names and so on. I mean, I would just leave it on default, but anyway. Oh, you can't, if it gets really confusing, you can't set it to show only certain types of ship names or so on. These controls over here, this is, you can add notes, etc. Most of this is unimportant. These are for handling air forces. Maybe I'll make a separate video on that at some point or something. This that says all the world's fighting ships is just your almanac again. Uh, in case you want to, basically once you identify an enemy ship's class, you can look here to see uh, information that you know on them. Uh, this is your log of the battle. This is just going to tell you what time sunrise and sunset is, which can be very important to be fair, but you can also kind of just eyeball it by zooming out and literally looking at these darkness lines on the map. Uh, this is your weather. It also says your weather down here, along with your wind and your sighting ranges. And then, sort of, these are the critical controls, honestly. Most of all of this and all of this you won't have to touch in an average battle. This only if you have planes. Right here, once you get your settings tweaked to your liking anyway. Right here, this is how, how you actually run battles. Uh... This will just advance one turn, which is one minute. It's only really useful if you're in the thick of an actual battle. This is five minutes, which is more reasonable. This will run a certain number of hours. Uh, however, it will stop if important events happen. This just runs until important events happen. This stops it immediately. And this alters your game speed, which is normal is fine while in battles most of the time. Uh, during long post-battle sequences when like you're returning to port or something, if you haven't sunk everything, you might want to turn it up to very fast or something in order to just breeze by time when you're not really in combat. Anyway, so that's how you control time during a battle. I'm going to press plus five, plus five, until we actually spot the enemy, which will come like this always. And then you can see unidentified ship here. How you control your fleet, then, is pretty simple. You select them. I can't really exactly show you because we actually only have one division, but uh, you click on this little yellow flag or you draw a select box over them. It'll be a red flag if it's not your selected division. It's yellow if it is your selected division. So you click. It'll turn yellow to show you you've selected. And then these are basically your controls down here. You can adjust your speed. Uh, cruising speed is usually 12 knots. I think maybe it's higher in late game. You've got presets for certain speeds or squad max, which is just the squadron max, which is just the fastest speed that your selected ships can do. Or you can manually adjust it by clicking these arrows. Technically, you can set your course manually by clicking through here or by typing even. Uh, this turn together thing is like the battle turn that the Germans did. You can do that. Uh, basically, 
You set your speed either by most of the time in battle, frankly, squadron max, and then cruise when you're not in battle, unless you need to slow down to, say, bombard a stationary enemy ship or something, or a land target. And then, honestly, you can adjust your course manually, but what you do most of the time is you click this little red arrow, and your cursor will look like this, and you click whichever direction you want to go. You have to eyeball that a little. It's maybe not the greatest system, but you click. Like, if I click here, the ships will just head to this point, and past this point. They'll just keep going in this direction. It'll take them a little minute to turn, but they'll start doing it immediately. Uh, sighting ranges are very well modeled, and identification process. So the enemy ships will initially look totally unidentified. You can maybe tell a little from their size. And then it'll start to say, okay, that's maybe a battleship. Sometimes it will get that wrong. Ships can very easily be misidentified in battle, especially at long range. Once it comes up with a class like this, usually that's when you have a positive identification. Typically, that's pretty reliable. If it says that's what class it is, that's what class it actually is. So now I'm going to wait until we get into gun range, which we are right now. And so then you'll get these lines that show what each of your ships is firing at. You'll get these little white, uh, these white shell dots will start to appear around the enemy ships, which just indicate where your shells have landed. Um, your firing rate is not necessarily one per turn. It depends on how old your guns are and how big your guns are. I think we're firing less than once per turn. And you can't really control in detail. Well, you can set targets and such. I should show you. If you um, right-click on the division flag, it will let you adjust their formation, which can be quite important. You can change between... Because this is a battleship formation, you can just pick line ahead or abreast. Line ahead is what we're in, which is where they form a nice line like this. If you have a scouting formation, you can use this to change it to more spread out or less spread out, etc. You can experiment it with a little, it a little. You can set it to be controlled by the AI if you want to not worry about it. And what it'll do then is it'll just follow your flagship formation. Um, in whatever role and formation you have selected, it'll just do that, and it'll stick right next to your flagship. Uh, you can pick some fancy things here, like make smoke, or request air cover, or hold fire. And you can adjust, you can steer from here too, for whatever reason, I don't really, that seems a little uncalled for to me, but you can. You can also detach ships here, but I wouldn't advise that usually. You can do manual targeting. Technically, in a two-ship battle like this, manual targeting might be called for, but it's not vital. And then what will happen as you fight is finally, eventually, our accuracy sucks because it's 1892, but uh, eventually you will start to land hits, which will come up in black on the log over here. I don't really know where these guys are going, so it's not going to be a very good demonstration, but, uh... Alright. They're just running away infinitely, apparently. Turning. Oh, there. Uh, uh, uh. Kind of lost it because I was rushing, but there was one there. Hits will show up in black over here. You'll get other messages. That basically, you'll get opens fire. You'll get hits that are scored. You'll get if you're doing something like limits flooding because you've taken damage, which means we took a hit. At any time, you can right click on any individual ship and see exactly what its damage status is right here. You can also see things like how much ammunition it's got left, exactly, and so on. And you'll fight either until you've sunk every enemy ship, or you run out of time, or everybody has returned to port, which, if you want to return to port, you just zoom out on the map until you find a port, which 
I think because this is a fleet exercise, they're not showing up, but they will show up as basically flags on the coast. And if you steer to a port, like right up to the flag, you'll just go into the port. Uh, or you can choose whether to go into the port. And ports are uh, inviolate in this game, essentially. If you can make it into a port, you are 100% safe. So there's no real reason not to. I'm just trying to sort of I don't know why they're just continuously running away, but uh, trying to sort of fight this battle. I think it's because I picked two weaker battleships than mine, so they think the best thing to do is just to run away. That's on me, I guess. Most battleships against or battles against the enemy are a good deal more exciting than this, but this is a highly contrived demonstration battle that I set up. Sometimes the enemy will just run away if they're inferior. And that's when you need ships that are actually faster than theirs in order to catch them. Plus, accuracy is terrible at the start of the game and gets better as you go on. Yeah, this chase is just going to be infinite, huh? Uh, but so you'll get notices as hits are landed, as damage piles up, things will happen like your engines can get hit or turrets knocked out, uh, steering jammed, bridges hit, etc. There's a fairly detailed damage model altogether. Uh, the most critical things that can actually sink your ship are, well, either big explosions or if this flooding bar reaches full, your ship will sink. Or if your ship is completely consumed by fire, uh, which will usually be represented by a ton of structural damage and also a big fire, which you can see in the log. Uh, and literally on the screen, it'll be on fire. Then that will also sink your ship eventually. Those are the three main ways, I would say, either magazine detonations, flooding, or fire. And it's become dark because we've been sailing in circles for hours and hours. Oh, hey, we're two feet away from each other in the dark. Still can't land any hits because it's real dark. Oh, wait, we just finally did. There we go, okay. That, this bold is what it looks like when a hit is landed. You can never see really exactly how much damage you've done to an enemy ship because of the fog of war, but if you mounts over them, it will tell you not only their speed, but if you have hit them, it will tell you how much damage it looks like you've done. That's not 100%. It's also not necessarily possible to know for sure that you've sunk an enemy ship until it actually sinks. However... Usually, if it slows to zero knots, it's probably dead. Probably. Uh, this is very much a game where double tap is a good good idea. Um, the reason this ship just sailed in a circle is because we must have hit its rudder, and it's now broken. So we're just going to bombard it right here, and maybe if our gunners could get their act together, you'd see what a lot of hits looked like, but apparently not. It is dark now. So you'll have to forgive them a little. Still kind of embarrassing, to be honest. Okay, there was a couple. We're probably not going to be able to sink her even with this range, because battleships are really bad at sinking each other in 1892, but uh, such is life. Uh, warfare does get massively more deadly as time goes on. Ships in the early era have really low accuracy. And relatively weak guns. And then towards the end, battles become very quick because with radar-guided guns, whoever has more firepower and shoots first will win almost immediately. This guy's really broken his rudder, though. Wow.
you will notice we've exceeded the elapsed the time limit, but because we are still fighting, it hasn't ended the battle. Oh, he finally fixed his rudder. I'm just going to break off because I think I've showed you everything I need to for battles. And the battle should end momentarily as soon as it's satisfied that we're out of range of each other. Yep. Um, so then this screen will show you effectively what each side had in the battle, how much damage they took. You can see that in a lot of detail if you hit ship details here. And you can look at, say, their battleship and see exactly how many hits you landed, exactly how much damage it took. You can hit log entries and look in pretty considerable detail. I mean, really, like, you know exact ranges and locations of hits if you're that kind of nerd which i am sometimes um and then this is sort of the points value of each of that amount of damage that's just an internal game thing for calculating who won look at that we won because we shot that battleship up a lot while it was running in circles uh that said only ships that are actually sunk are really you know sunk if you just cause damage, even heavy damage, heavy damage or medium damage will knock a ship out for potentially as much as like three or four months or more, maybe even sometimes. Uh, it'll just go into dockyards and be repaired, but it will come back after that time. So only actually sunk ships are really, really worth anything. Now, if this had been in a war, there would be a screen here that told you how many victory points each side got from that battle. That was just an exercise, so there's not. Um, I think that is about everything that you need to know to play Rule the Waves 3 pretty successfully. Um, officers, you can reassign or promote to move to pool by right-clicking on them. In general, the game is complicated in a certain sense, and it will help you to know about naval tactics or history a little bit. But it's not as unapproachable as the interface makes it seem. A lot of the functions, like, honestly, the auto design of a ship is really pretty good. I wouldn't just stick with what it does always. But it does give a good starting baseline if this whole thing looks pretty daunting. Uh, the battles themselves are re really relatively easy to control your ships in. And you can usually keep abreast of what you need to build just by sort of looking at the almanac and comparing yourself to what everybody else has built. So, you know, consider giving it a shot if you're interested. Uh, obviously, it's only a game for maybe a certain type of person, but I do think it's a very fun game overall. If you do happen to enjoy it, I'm glad. Uh, if you have more questions that I didn't answer here, feel free to leave them in the comments. I'll try to answer them. Thank you, everybody, for watching. I hope this helped some of you out. Uh, have a good day.